Hey everybody, this is Francis and this is Freight Options vlog number 5. I'd like to talk about today about a really important topic which a lot of agents and clients and importers have been asking me and that is Francis, how do you import items in the Philippines? Let's talk about the four general documents that customs requires for every single import. First of all, we need the invoice. Second, we need the packing list. Third, we need the bill of lading or the airway bill. And fourth, all importers must have an import permit to be secured from Bureau of Customs. I'd like to emphasize that this, these four requirements are always needed for every single import. There are also additional documents such as the Bureau of Product Standards or the Nat National Telecommunications Commission permit, but these side requirements depend on the particular commodity that you're that you are importing so let's not talk about this for now let's talk about first what are the four main requirements first is an invoice an invoice is a document which shows the value of the item which is being imported this is important because we customs and actually even brokers need to figure out how much will be charged as duties and taxes for each import. The next requirement is a packing list. A packing list is a document which shows the number of items, the quality of the item, a short description of the item, and a description as to how the items are packed when you are bringing it into the Philippines. This is important because we have to remember that when you import anything in the Philippines, the four documents that I mentioned, the bill of lading, packing list, the invoice, and the import permit, all have to have consistent data. And none of them must have any, any changes from the data that you have put in each of those documents. So for example, if your packing list says that you have 36 boxes which are arriving, and for some reason, during the transship during the course of transshipment in another port, your shipping line decided to offload like half of the load, then we will have a problem in the Philippines. Because Philippine rules and regulations do not take into account changes during the middle of the uh, transportation of any item. If you are going to release the item, the items have to have the same quality and have to have the same number as what is written on their packing list. They also have to have the invoice value, which is, should be the market value of the item. The next thing you need is, of course, the bill of lading or the airway bill. And this is the shipping document which shows your contract of transport between your shipping line, you, your shipping line, and your airline and or your airline. Lastly, we also need to have an import permit. All importers in the Philippines need to have an import permit. The only exceptions are balik bayan boxes, but balik bayan boxes have their own rules for importation. We'll discuss rules on balik bayan boxes in a future video. And I've had friends who said, Francis, it's so hard to import to the Philippines. You know, one day you have this rule, you have this requirement for a document, and the next day, you don't need that requirement for the document anymore. One day, the customs will not allow a certain commodity to be brought in because of restrictions, but yet, you'll find other people who are bringing in the same particular commodity without any problems. And to them, I say, yes, that is exactly how Philippines Customs works. Being an importing country, the government has to worry about a lot of dangerous, or illegal items that are going to be entering the Philippines. Because of this, over the course of a few years, the government has had so many rules and regulations which limit or restrain uh, imports to the Philippines. And in fact, even now, we are experiencing another wave of rules and regulations which the government is trying to bring out or trying to implement this coming year. So as you can see, every single year, or sometimes even a span of a few months, we have new rules and regulations which the customs 
wants to implement. I'd also like to point out that over the course of the last three years, we've had three commissioners, customs commissioners, who have taken their posts. While this may not mean much for most people, each different customs commissioner emphasizes a different program that they want to implement. This also means that for each customs commissioner, their program or their priority in the programs are different depending on what they want to promote or what trade relationships do they want to emphasize or improve. This means that for example, for, for, for some customs commissioners, they would like to prevent the use of balik bayan boxes. And there was a time wherein there, the importation of balik bayan boxes or other or personal effects boxes were strictly regulated by the government. And this made it very hard for overseas Filipino workers to send their goods from the, from the countries that they're working from Back to the to, back to the Philippines, and this is a this was a problem. Now the focus is not on personal effects, but rather for smuggled goods by entities who actually smuggle illegal items such as drugs into the Philippines. So as you can see, there is a change of perspective depending on whoever is seated as the customs representative or customs commissioner at a certain point in time. There was even a certain point in time wherein the customs commissioner declared that there would not be any brokers allowed to deal with the Bureau of Customs. They were encouraging direct consignees to deal with the Bureau in order to curb corruption in the Bureau of Customs. This means that every time we deal with customs, we have to make sure that the regulations that the customs commissioner wants to emphasize is being strictly followed. The result of these many rules and regulations is a very complicated and wide-reaching uh, classification system which requires in-depth knowledge of individual parts of items and their descriptions. I'm just saying that basically Every single part, whether it's a minor, minute screw or whether it's a whole television set, each of those parts is being scrutinized by the government to determine whether or not they will be taxed a certain rate. As I said, there have been several regulations and each regulation or each period has different emphasis as to which regulations will be implemented. And to be honest, even with the four documents that I had mentioned earlier as requirements for the Philippines, not all of them are being strictly followed either. Say for example, with your invoice. Normally, when you show any other customs agent an invoice, or a custom, when you show any other customs representative an invoice, you would be right to assume that they would see this invoice and say, hey, this is the value of the good. I'm going to be taxing it as per the value that they declare. However, as with any other prudent organization, they are going to check whether or not the value in the invoice is undervalued or if it's the right value. And in order for them to prove that this is the right value, they usually just check the internet. Or if they don't check the internet, they will be checking previous shipments of the same commodity. The value will then be the basis of whether or not your item has been underdeclared. Now this is dangerous because if an item has been underdeclared, you're subject to penalties, surcharges, which could be a headache for any importer, especially one, small ones who don't really have the budget to put in a lot of money into customs because of these penalties or surcharges. So. What is the solution in order to avoid these kinds of situations? The solution that Customs gives us by their own statements whenever we interview them is you need to have proof of payment. What is proof of payment? Basically, it's any document which shows that you had paid the certain amount you mentioned in the invoice 
to your supplier. This is a problem because a lot of our companies or a lot of businesses in the Philippines don't really pay their suppliers yet until the lapse of a period such as 30 days or depending on whatever terms that they have with their supplier. Now, Customs does not accept the fact that, hey, you haven't paid your, custom, your supplier yet, therefore, you can use this value to import it. If without proof of payment, there is no way for us to negotiate with Customs that, hey, this is really the amount that I paid for to, to get this item. So even if the item was really discounted, for example, you had a supplier from China, and he was able to give you a... 30% or 50% discount on your e-cigarettes if you want to import them to the Philippines. Great. Let's say that the value is $100. You're able to pay for only $50 in order to bring to buy the items from them. And, you're able, and you want to bring it into the Philippines to sell it for $100. Now, customs will come in. They'll see the first shipment that you bring in and say, hey, According to the internet, or according to previous shipments that have been brought in, this is actually $100. And they have all the power in the world to say that since it's $100, we will be taxing you $100, even though your real deal with your supplier is only $50. So we have a lot of complaints, a lot of... We have a lot of complaints, and we have a lot of instances where this has happened, and the consignee and our clients are just so confused as to why customs is doing this to them because they're only a small company so what customs always replies to us is you have to have proof of payment but how can you have proof of payment how can you have items like telegraphic transfers which show that you have deposited this amount to the bank of your supplier or items which show any amount of payment or a receipt, an official receipt from your supplier if you haven't paid for the item or if the item is on consignment basis. There is no way to prove it. So, Customs has the right to tax you according to their known market value in their systems. And this is, this is one of the things which a lot of our clients or a lot of the agents don't understand is why is it that Customs is charging us this amount, X, an X amount, when in fact, the taxable value should only be a 50% discount or a 50% value of the item. And this is exactly the problem that we always face. So what is the solution according to rules, to law? But basically, you have no choice. You really have to show a document which proves that you were paying for this amount. One of the documents which I suggest our clients is to have a sales contract because this will show that you have an agreed price between your supplier and you. So this is what we will do. This is the document that we will show to customs in order to bring to tax the item according to how you agreed it with it with your supplier. This is the document we will show to customs to prove that the item that you are buying from your supplier is said amount, is of the said amount. Now, the problem with this, however, is not everyone has sales contracts. Again, some people have business on trust, and this could be a problem. If that's the case, then you have really have no choice but to accept the assessment of customs. The problem is if you accept the assessment of customs, you run into a whole new uh, layer of problems because now customs will say you've undervalued, you've underdeclared the value, and you're subject to surcharges and penalties. So even if, so the other thing is, so everything I'm telling you right now is with regard to a person who has not been re importing regularly. Because all the problems that I've been t telling you about with regard to the documentation of, of items really only happens during the first two, first, the first two or three imports of the item. You see, 
dealing with customs is like dealing with any other organization or business. These people aren't aren't uh, uh, these people aren't uh, unreasonable. You can actually negotiate with them, and here lies the problem. See, negotiating with customs means that you have to have a certain level of trust between the consignee and the customs broker, or the look, sorry, not the customer, the customs. Uh, you have to have a certain level of trust between the consignee and the appraisers or examiners of customs. This means that the trust is only developed if you have several shipments of the same nature, of the same value, and you've proven each and every single one of those two or three shipments has a consistent value that the customs will no longer question. So, if you're importing for the first, second, or third time, don't be surprised if customs will require you to have the documents that I just mentioned earlier. And don't be surprised if, for example, a forwarder in the Philippines would say, hey, we can release cargo within one to two days, but when you suddenly import items for the first, second, or third time, it takes a week or five days to release the item. It's simply because the items have not been established by customs as a regular item. So they are scrutinizing it and will do everything in their power to make sure that they prevent any illegal or, or misdeclared item from entering the Philippines. So you really have to have a certain number of days for, for new importers to negotiate with customs before any item can be brought in. So while we would say, as Freight Options Corporate, we really can release items within one to two days from their arrival, if it's a new item, if you're a new agent or if you're a new client and you have this new item that you bring in, that it may take a little longer time for us to process the documents and to release the item. So here's another funny situation that we happens a lot in Philippine customs. Number one, uh, and this is, even if you have been an importer for a long time, if you switch brokers or if you switch the persons, the people who are going to be releasing your goods or cargo, uh, we will have the experience that customs will still make it hard for you to import that first, second, or third shipment that you have with a new broker. This is because, once again, customs is trying to establish a relationship with you, the consignee, or the, or the new broker. Customs is basically saying, hey, this old broker has been doing this, uh, has been releasing this particular cargo for a long time. Now that you're handling it, how can I be sure that you're still handling the very same commodity? That the previous broker has been releasing. So once again, it's another negotiation. It's another few more tries of just keeping of conf of confirming to customs that hey, we're handling this cargo. This cargo has this certain value, and we have proof that this is exactly the value that our client has paid for. And please allow us to release it in an efficient and cost-efficient manner. As with anything which is changing or as with anything which is new, there are always going to be factors which will resist this change. And customs is one of those factors. Therefore, again, as I said, we have to negotiate with customs and we have to tell them that no, the items have not changed. This is still the consignee. They are still paying this amount. And so we request that you release the cargo without any problems, please. Sometimes they say no, which will cause some delays. And we hope that uh, our future clients will understand that this is just one of those safeguard methods that Customs uses to prevent any mistakes of importation or smuggling activities, which happen a lot, by the way, in the Philippines. So I hope this uh, little uh, video was informative, and I hope I was able to explain to you the basic importation rules of customs. In my next video, I think I will decide, I, I'm, I'm thinking about what to 
blog about, but we're probably going to be talking about the requirements of, of first-time importers. Because what's funny is, I've told you the general documents required for any import. However, again, if it's the first time that you're importing any goods, you have a lot of documents which, we, which you need to pr provide customs before they allow you an import permit. So I guess I'll make a video out of the requirements of an import permit, what's required for the first importation, because before you can get an import permit, one of the requirements is you've actually imported once. So how do you do that if you haven't been able to, to have an import permit yet? So I guess that'll be in my next video. And so I hope to see you in the next one, and uh, good night. Thank you.